Good evening. I've been asked to give you two talks on the subject, where was God in the tsunami? It's a question being widely asked in the press and in many minds. You know, five days after the 9-11 disaster, when the Twin Towers of New York collapsed, I was invited to give a talk on that, and I feel much the same tonight. But what a difference between the two events. The tsunami killed, what, 50 times as many people as 9-11? What I call 26-12 was far worse, damaged far more property right around the world and affected many nations too. But the biggest difference between the two disasters, the two tragedies, was that this one was not caused by human beings. 9-11 was directly caused by us or by them. And so this is what some people, the insurance people, call an act of God. I'm not sure that that means a lot these days, except that it's something they can't insure against because it had no human content. To me, it's almost as meaningless as swearing on a Bible in a court of law that you will tell the truth. These are all vestiges of our godly past. Well, now, here we have this disaster which we've all witnessed on television. We've seen it happen. The horror of it has come home to us. Let's just consider for a moment the human needs that are waiting after such a disaster. The first needs after a disaster are physical. The need for medical aid to the wounded, for burial of the dead, for food, water, shelter. And there is an outpouring of aid from the whole wide world into the Indian Ocean area where the disaster took place. But those physical needs very quickly give way to emotional needs. There is the shock, the trauma, and counselors are needed for uh, those who are suffering from literally a shock wave. After that shock has subsided a bit, the next emotion to be dealt with is grief. And I feel very deeply for those who have lost loved ones, especially for those who have no news, who are waiting for news. I'm reminded of the days in World War II where somebody would bring a telegram which said, missing in action. And the people would never know. This happened to my cousin. She escaped from Malaya when the Japanese came in with her two sons, but she never knew what happened to her husband for years. She didn't know if she was a widow. And for years she had to live with this ignorance which was even harder to bear than if she had been told, as she later learned, that her husband was killed by the Japanese. So then, after shock, comes sorrow and grief, and then comes anger. After every disaster, there is an anger that needs to be directed, someone to blame, a scapegoat. And people look around for someone to vent their anger on, and that anger needs to be dealt with. In this case, of course, the scapegoat is God himself. And I've already heard many people blaming God for what happened. They can't blame anyone. They can blame Tony Blair for not breaking his holiday and coming back to take charge of the situation. But they know full well that there is no human being to blame in this case. God becomes the scapegoat. The tragedy is that after every disaster, people are either drawn nearer to God, or they are driven further from God. One or the other is bound to happen to all of us, even if we were not personally involved. And so I move to the third need. There are the physical needs, food, water, medicine, shelter. There are the emotional needs, shock, grief, anger. But then come what I want to call the intellectual needs. There is a need in every human being to make sense of what has happened, to ask deeper questions. And we are moving now already from the first and second needs into the third, as people ask these big questions. And there are two major questions which everybody wants to ask. First, how? How did this happen? 
How did it come to happen? What caused it, naturally speaking? And of course, science is the uh, answer to this. And we now know what happened. We know that two tectonic plates rubbed up against each other, got caught, and the movement stopped for a bit and then suddenly was released. And the energy released was so enormous, it sent a gigantic wave around the whole Indian Ocean. Do you know that it even wobbled planet Earth two inches on its axis? So the whole Earth moved. It was a gigantic thing, but we know how it happened. And of course, the reason for asking the question, how did it happen, is so that we can avoid it or escape it, or at the very least, have warning. The sad thing is that the Pacific Ocean has such a warning about tsunamis, but the Indian Ocean, being in a poorer part of the world and not next door to America, didn't have it. But that's the first question that the intellect needs to ask and answer, if possible, to escape or avoid it the next time. But there is an even more important question that people's minds grapple with and need to be satisfied about, and that is, why? Not just how, but why did it happen? We need to find a reason for it, because the one thing we can't cope with is senseless suffering wasted suffering, wasted life, wasted property. And so we want to know why it happened. Is there any reason behind it? Is there any sense in it? Or do we have to live with something that has no reason at all and therefore leaves us suspended in our mental questions? Well, now it may seem heartless to be discussing these objective questions now, but nevertheless, I believe it's necessary, if not only for the reason that God is being blamed. I want to defend God. I believe in him, I trust him. And I believe a lot of blame is unnecessarily and even wrongly attached to God in this kind of situation. Now, I'm going to be dealing in this first talk tonight with some of the wrong answers that are being given to this question why, even by Christians and church leaders. So tonight is going to be a little negative, I'm afraid, but I want to clear the decks for the true answer, what I believe is the Bible answer, to this appalling question, this deep question, where was God in all this? Now, the fact that we must come to terms with is that we live in a fragile and even a hostile environment. We are clinging to life by our fingertips. The whole vast universe rapidly expanding, and in that whole universe, planet Earth is a tiny speck of interstellar dust. And there are asteroids out there that could hit us any moment and deal with the human race in the way that it dealt with the dinosaurs, and they've gone. And then coming to planet Earth itself, we live in this tiny, thin, wafer-like atmosphere around the planet. It's so thin, and if we go 10 miles up, we're dead, and if we go 10 miles down, we're dead. We can only live in this tiny little wafer thin. Do you know that no man has been into space yet? Because you can't live in space. The only way we can get men up there is to give them a capsule of Earth with enough of Earth's air and water and food in it, and then they can go out into space. But they haven't gone into space. They've taken Earth with them. One American astronaut was asked, did you meet God out there? And he smilingly said, I would have done if I stepped out of my space suit. You see, we are trapped in this tiny, thin layer around planet Earth, and already we know how delicately it's balanced. Global warming is a threat. The weather in the 1970s took a turn for the worse, and now it is increasingly erratic, and life is becoming less and less secure. And now we have learned that the Earth beneath our feet is not solid. We are floating on plates of rock called tectonic plates. And these are colliding with each other and slipping under each other. 
and the being renewed on one side and dissolved again on the other were all floating on these very delicate plates. So life is increasingly fragile and increasingly hostile. It's really quite amazing that any of us are surviving under such conditions. And so this raises the urgent question, is there anybody up there in charge? Is there anybody in control of our universe? Or is it just running in its own way haphazardly and anything could happen anywhere? In other words, if this universe is an accident, then it's not surprising that accidents will happen. Is it a matter of chance or choice that we are here? Are we indebted to something, some force, or someone? That is the most basic philosophical question that man can ask, and it's been discussed for many, many years, centuries. And there are many, many answers to that question. Is there anyone in charge, or is there a God? I want to run through some of the different answers that have been given to that question, because with some of those answers, there is no problem with tsunamis or earthquakes or any other natural disaster. With others, the problem becomes very acute. Let's take the answer called, by the way, all these answers are called isms. Let's take the first answer, atheism. That says there is no God. That this universe evolved by chance. We are here by chance, by luck in other words. And therefore, to atheism, there is no problem about natural disasters. That's the way it is. That's the way it's evolved. We must accept it, live with it, try and survive through it. But there's no problem. There's no intellectual why, because that question becomes irrelevant if there's no one in charge, if there is no God. There's another ism like that, very close to it, called agnosticism which means the don't knows. People who don't know whether there's a God or not. People who just say, well, there might be or there might not be. Now to them, there is no problem either. If anything, natural disasters tend to drive agnostics nearer to atheism rather than theism, which believes in God. But on the whole, they don't have a real problem. They're not asking that question. Then there's a funny ism called polytheism, which says there are many gods, many gods controlling our environment, and natural disasters are the result of some of those gods falling out with other gods. When you believe in many gods, you can believe that these disasters are a result of quarreling among them. Then we have dualism. Now, this is more common. Dualism tends to believe in two gods, one bad and one good. And if there are two gods up there and one is responsible for all the good things that happen and the other responsible for all the bad things, you've no problem because that's the way it is. And some Christians tend to get quite near to dualism when they think the devil is as powerful as God and they attribute all the bad things that happen to the devil and all the good things that happen to God. That's dualism. Listen, the devil is a creature like us. He's not the creator. He's not all powerful. And we mustn't attribute everything bad to him, though we can attribute quite a bit. Then we come a bit nearer to monotheism, which believes there is one God. And now we're beginning to have a problem. If there's only one God, then he must be responsible for natural disasters. And so it's, it's not atheists and agnostics and polytheists and dualists who have the problem, but monotheists certainly do. If you believe that this is a universe because there is only one person in charge of it, then he must be held responsible for what happens in it. But even with, within monotheism, we have a further question that we've got to sort out. I hope I'm not confusing you with all this, but if there's one God, there isn't a problem if that God is bad. At best, he doesn't care about us, or at worst, he enjoys seeing us suffer. And I've heard people say both of those. 
And if you believe that the one God in charge of this universe is a bad man, a bad God, a bad person, then there's no problem. When he does bad things, that's because he's a bad person. But supposing he's a mixture of good and bad, like most of us are, that he does good things and bad things. Well, again, there's no problem. It just means that when we have a bad disaster, he's having a bad day. He's in a bad mood. If you believe that God is both um, bad and good, and sometimes one, sometimes the other, there is no problem. We've now got to the heart of the intellectual problem. And the heart of it is that Christians believe in a God who's totally good, thoroughly good, with no bad in him whatsoever. And now we have a real problem. How could a God in charge of all this, in control of all this, allow such bad things to happen? See, what I'm trying to say is this. A person who says, I've got a problem, why did God allow this, has already assumed two things, that God is good and that he's almighty. And those are two things that Christians believe, which the Bible teaches. And so only those who assume those two things have an intellectual problem with tsunamis. If, to put it very simply, if God is all-powerful and all-loving, then how can such things happen in which there is so much suffering? That's the problem in a nutshell. We've got to the heart of it now, but I'm really pointing out that only those who believe those two things about God have a problem that they've got to wrestle with. And because I'm a Christian and because I believe the Bible, I have that problem, and I have to find an answer to it. Now, there are a number of wrong answers that have been given even by Christians, even by church leaders. I've been listening to the broadcasts and studying the newspapers over the last few days since it happened, and I've been hoping to hear a clear explanation from a Christian, but I haven't heard one yet. Maybe I haven't been listening to the right broadcasts or reading the right newspapers or books or articles, nevertheless. I was so grateful for this opportunity to work through to what I believe is a very satisfactory explanation of natural disasters. But first, as I said at the beginning, I'm going to concentrate on the wrong answers that are being given. And I want to say why I believe they're wrong. They may have an element of truth in them, but they don't, in the last resort, satisfy this big question in my mind. Because I need to have an answer to the question why that is satisfying in two ways. First, to my mind, and second, to my conscience. I need both, because I'm a human being who thinks, and I'm a human being with a conscience that knows the difference between right and wrong, as every one of you watching me has. You have a mind that puzzles over things, that gets bewildered. You have a conscience that tells you when you're doing something less than your best or something positively wrong. Now, we could think of explanations that are mentally satisfying to my mind, but don't satisfy my conscience. They seem to be wrong in some way. Let me deal with then with three wrong answers that do not satisfy me. The first that many Christian preachers give is this. Suffering is a mystery. You will never understand it. You cannot understand it because you're not God. And God's ways are so much higher than our ways and God's thoughts are so much higher than our thoughts that we'll never understand why he does it. We must therefore trust him to believe that he has good reasons for himself which he's chosen not to share with us, and so we can't understand it. Our little minds can't grasp. There's an element of truth in this, and one book in the Bible really seems to say that this is the case, and that's the book of Job. Job suffered greatly, lost his family, lost his business, lost his property, and finally lost his health. It all was taken from him. 
and he couldn't understand why. He was quite sure he didn't deserve it. And that's the moral problem that he had. He knew that he hadn't been very wicked. He knew that. His friends were quite sure he had. We call them Job's comforters. And they came and said to him, you must have sinned pretty badly to have all this happen to you. And they were wrong, and God said they were wrong. But when you read the book of Job, one thing hits you, and it's this, that God never told him why. And right at the end, God really hammered him <laughs> with a most extraordinary argument. He said, Job, I want you to meditate on the hippopotamus. Now, that's the cure for depression, according to the Bible. Meditate on the hippopotamus. When you're puzzled, when you're depressed, when you don't know what's happening, think about the hippopotamus. Why? Do you know why God made the hippopotamus? Of course you don't. Then he went on to talk about the crocodile. Job, do you know why I created that? Job, you're getting a bit too big for your boots asking all these whys. And Job finally surrendered and said, God, I shouldn't have said what I said. I shouldn't have questioned you like that. I'm just man and you're God. And actually, that was enough for God to restore all that he'd lost. But that's not the whole story. I believe that if we resort to saying suffering is always a mystery, that we will never really satisfy the questions that people are asking. So let's go a bit further. It is silly to simply ask, say some. You shouldn't ask why. You'll just drive yourself into a frustration, even a bitterness, because you won't get the answer. God isn't telling. So it's a silly thing to do. And some Christians have gone even further and said it's a wrong thing to do. Who do you think you are questioning God? And of course, we need to remember, here's the element of truth in this, that God is not accountable to me. He doesn't have to justify what he does to me and tell me what he can do or can't do. And I mustn't tell him what he can and can't do. That would be sheer impudence. The Bible calls it the clay arguing with the potter. And we are out of place. And yet, you know, this idea that suffering is a mystery, that it always will be, that little me will never understand, it leaves me unsatisfied for a number of reasons. First of all, God wants me to love him. More than that, he has commanded me to love him. But if he doesn't explain these disasters to me, he's not encouraging me to love him, is he? He's not encouraging me to trust him when he does things like this and I, I'm, it blows my mind. That's the first thing. If I'm to love God, then he must be a God I can understand. He must share with me the reasons why he does things so that I can understand his mind and, and well relate to him. Jesus said to his disciples, I'm telling you all this because you're my friends. And God wants friends. He wants me to be his friend. Abraham was his friend. And with a friend, you explain why you're doing something that hurts your friend. Of course you do. Then there's another reason why I believe this isn't the full answer, and it's simply this. What can I learn from disasters if God doesn't tell me anything about them? What lessons can I learn? What improvements can I make in my life? What, what adaptation can I make to his laws and, and his love if he doesn't explain anything to me? And the third reason why I find this answer, suffering is a mystery and we'll never know, is this. Throughout the Bible, God is explaining things to people. And when disaster comes, he explains why it comes. In fact, to the prophet Amos, he said, I never send anything to my people Israel without warning them first. And that's only just and fair of God to do this if disaster is coming. He will tell us why. God is constantly explaining himself in the Bible from beginning to end. That's the kind of God he is. He wants us to know. 
And the word mystery to God is not what it means to us. The word mystery, when it occurs in Scripture, means something that God has now told us, but something that we could never have understood for ourselves, something we could never have discovered. For example, Paul talks in the letter to the Romans about the mystery that God will one day save all the Jewish people. And that's something that nobody could have found out for themselves. Nobody would have guessed it. And yet, Paul says, I'm telling you a mystery. And the best translation of the word mystery in uh, the Bible is a secret that God has now revealed. Something that only he knew and understood, but which now he is sharing with us. This is the general picture of God in the Bible, a God who shares with us the reasons why he does things, because he wants us to respond to them in the right way. Now put all those reasons together, and here we have a real blockage to the idea that all suffering will always be a mystery. Now I know there are some things we don't understand and pray one day will when we see God as he really is and see things from his point of view and begin to understand. For example, in my own case, my wife was dying of cancer, but God had mercy and healed her, and she's still with me 20 years later. But my daughter died a few years later of leukemia, and this raises a question in my mind. Naturally, why did he heal my wife and take my daughter? I believe he has given me the answer to both questions. But nevertheless, at the time, I didn't understand and had to wrestle with my thinking until I believed I was thinking God's way and not mine. So the first wrong answer, I believe, is to say tsunamis are a complete mystery. You will never understand. God may, and he may have his reasons, but he's not telling us and we must just accept. It's a kind of resignation. It's a kind of fatalism. It's a kind of saying it's God's will, so I must just simply submit to his will. And that is being said by some religions and even some Christians, that when these disasters happen, it is best to be quite stoic about them and say God's will be done and keep calm and not get agitated about it but it doesn't work with me. Let's look at a second wrong answer, I believe, that's inadequate, and that is look at all the good that comes out of disaster. As if to say the good that comes out of it justifies the bad in it. It's an extraordinary uh, argument, but let's look at it. At the time, a disaster doesn't feel very good, but there's no doubt that afterwards there is a release of all that is best in human nature. Even in it, there are sometimes wonderful stories of sacrifice to save others. And we've seen some examples of that in the press. Did you see the photograph of the woman who was dashing into the sea straight for the big wave to save her family? She could easily have drowned, but in fact, her family was saved. But I heard of other cases where parents saved their children at the cost of their own lives. Self-sacrifice comes out at the time, but afterwards, there is a wave of sympathy and support, in this case, from all over the world, because so many countries were affected. I was in Norway last week, and. Uh, there were 500 Norwegians missing. And next door in Sweden, there were thousands still missing, unaccounted for. And here in Britain, this has affected the whole world this time. But look at all the goodwill that has been released. We live in a selfish, greedy world where people are interested only in bettering themselves. And suddenly, people are becoming unselfish. People are giving sacrificially at great cost to themselves. They are going to rescue people, to serve them, to rebuild their lives, to rebuild their homes. There is so much good that has been released. 
that would never have been released but for the disaster. In other words, to use an old-fashioned word, charity is released. I know that word has a nasty taste to many, but the charity that has been released by this society, we need to take notice of. Normally selfish people are now unselfish. Materialist people are now thinking not of getting some more material possessions, but of, of giving some to those who have none, clothes and all kinds of other things. Shaken out of our selfishness, giving instead of getting, this shock wave has produced this immense reverse wave of goodwill and people say that really explains the disaster look what good it has done now of course we need to look at the whole picture i was shocked at some of the evil that has been released in human nature there has been looting otherwise called stealing in the ruins of cities and towns and villages. But there's even worse than that. I was horrified to find that human beings are kidnapping orphan children who've lost the rest of their family in order to sell them for adoption. And Sri Lanka has had to ban adoption for the time being to stop this dreadful trade in orphans. And then there are people who are stealing bodies, body snatchers, so that they can claim compensation, claiming that this is my loved one who was earning bread for the family, so that it's not all good. And a cynic could also say that this rush to help is a kind of collective insurance, a kind of collective self-preservation because do unto others as you would have them do unto you. In other words, we may be the next to suffer and we would hope that then others will look to our needs as we have looked to theirs. And in fact, of course, as I speak, there have been people dying in floods in Carlisle, in Oban, right here in the British Isles. And so the cynic would say it's a kind of instinct for the preservation of our species that wants to help and I say our species because so far there has been no attempt whatever to help to do something about the animals who've perished or are suffering and the animal rights people are talking about that quite uh, vociferously so there is a downside and the biggest downside of such a wave of human sympathy and support is that it fairly quickly fades. It is already off the front pages of the newspaper. It is no longer the first item in news bulletins on radio and television. And as the interest and concern gradually fades, so does the world go back to normal, back to its selfish greed back to its materialism, back to all that has been deeply shaken. We have an amazing capacity for quick recovery from shocks and things that happen that we don't welcome. There's another good thing, so-called, come out of this tragedy. I have very mixed feelings about it, but just as it has produced a wave of charity, it has produced a wave of unity. The world unites to meet the needs after a disaster. But it's not only a unity of nations or even races. The extraordinary thing is that people are welcoming the unity of religions that is now being seen. Last Sunday night, a few nights ago, I was watching Songs of Praise. That has always been a Christian program exclusive to Christian praise. Other programs on the BBC have become religious and now include other religions, Thought for the Day, 
and Sunday morning programs, Sunday has done the same thing, and there is as much about Islam as Christianity on Sunday morning. But Songs of Praise was kept for Christian praise to the Christian God, not last Sunday. It began with a statement rejoicing that the tsunami has brought nations and religions together. And for the first time ever, Songs of Praise was led by a Christian, a Muslim mullah, a Hindu priest, and a Buddhist monk. And the praise songs were from all those religions in the one program. And the whole program was a celebration of the unity that the tsunami has brought to the religions of the world. Now, I, honest with you, I have real mixed feelings about that. But the world would love to see the religions of the world united to serve the needs of the human race. I remember listening to a sermon by the Duke of Edinburgh, the only time I've heard him preach in a church. And his theme was very simple. It was an appeal to the world religions to unite to save wildlife and our environment. And that is what the church would love to see, the different religions no longer arguing with each other, fighting with each other, but uniting to serve the needs of mankind. A humanitarian religion would be very welcome to the world. Now, I'll say more about this next week. But these are the two things that are being singled out by the public as positive benefits. Now, what are they really saying? Are they trying to tell us that the good that comes out of a disaster justifies the bad in it? Are they actually arguing that God has deliberately done a bad thing in order to make us good, to bring out the better side of our nature? It certainly does that. But was God doing that? And was it too high a cost? the loss of 150,000 lives to make the rest of us a bit better, to release in us the good? I have problems with that. I have no doubt at all that people show the better side of their nature when there is a disaster. Many of them, some don't, but most do. I acknowledge that, but I don't think that justifies the bad thing. Indeed, it leads us to an extraordinary conclusion that we are better than God. That God did a bad thing, but we are doing so many good things as a result. You know, it's almost impudent to talk to God like that and say, God, we could run the world a good deal better than you do. If I was in charge, I wouldn't use that method to bring out the good in people. Somebody once told me, you know, every time you grumble about the weather, you're complaining about the way God runs the world. That really shook me. We are very good at criticizing God. We have a high view of our goodness and a low view of his badness. I'm going to show you next week that, in fact, that is the very opposite of the truth. If we start thinking we're very good in our behavior in a disaster, and God is very bad in causing it, then quite frankly, we are in real difficulties. So I move on to the third reason, third explanation that Christians are giving, and this is an extraordinary one. It really is. Let's go back to the problem again in its simplest form. If, if God is almighty, all-powerful, and all-good, all-loving. Why should these things happen? They shouldn't happen. God could stop them, even if he started them. And God shouldn't have started anyway. Well, now, here are the two assumptions behind every question, where was God in the tsunami? That he is almighty and that he is all-loving. Now, supposing one or other or even both of those assumptions is wrong, then the problem becomes a very different problem. If God is not almighty, then there isn't a problem. 
he couldn't have started it or stopped it. If God is not all loving, there isn't a problem. Now, this final wrong answer that I'm dealing with tonight says that God is not all powerful. I must give you another little lesson in philosophy, another lesson in two isms, because you can believe in God in two different ways. Theism, which is the philosophy of the Bible, believes that God created and controls our physical universe. He has created it in the beginning and he still controls it. That's called theism. But there is another philosophy called deism, which is slightly different. Deism believes that God created the world, but no longer controls it. And deism thinks of the world like this, that it, God made it like a big watch or clock and wound it up and then took his hands off it. And it goes on, on the way he designed it to go on, and he can't do anything about it. It's no longer in his control. Now, even many people in church are deists. They don't believe, for example, in miracles, because that would mean God interfering with the mechanism of the clock. It was widely believed in so-called scientific outlook that nature is a mechanism, a closed system, not open to anyone's influence. It is running on cast iron laws of its own, the law of gravity, the laws of nature, and even God himself cannot interfere with those laws now. So that God made nature once long ago, wound it up, and now nature goes on its own way. Deists would never ask God to change the weather, for example, because they would say he can't. The weather is running on its own cast iron laws and God himself is not almighty enough to interfere with that or to change it at his will. Now from that point of view comes the answer to the problem and I believe it's the wrong answer. Let me go back to uh, a television program I was watching with my wife a year or two back under the title Credo, which means I believe, there was a series of religious Christian programs called Credo. And the interviewer was speaking with a bishop. And the bishop was the chairman of the commission of the Anglican Church with uh, the task of revising the doctrine of the Church of England, bringing the beliefs of the Church of England up to date, adapting them for our modern era and our modern outlook. And the interviewer, who was not a Christian, a lady, she said to the bishop, what are you going to change in Christian beliefs in the Church of England? How differently are we to think of God? And the bishop replied quite openly, Oh, we must change our thinking about God. And she said, in what way? And he said, we must realize that God is weak. And to make the point even stronger, he said, as weak as water. And the interviewer was astonished and said, well, how do you imagine God? How do you think of him? And the dear bishop said this, he said, I think of we are all an extended family, like an extended family, the human race, and in the extended family there is a grandmother. And while all the family go to work and solve the problems and work hard to make their life pleasant, the grandmother's love holds the whole family together. And her love is the key to the unity of the family. They all love her and she loves them all while they do all the work. And the interviewer, in utter astonishment, said, but I thought God was a grandmother, was a father, not a grandmother. And the dear bishop looked not the slightest embarrassed at all. And she then asked, do you think that this view of God will fill the churches again? And he had the courage to say, 
I believe this will really bring people back to church when they realize how much God needs them. Not how much they need God, but how much God needs them. He was painting a picture of a weak God who was all loving, but couldn't do much himself and was relying on us to help him with the problems that we face. Now that is a relatively new view, but it's now quite widespread. In other words, when we ask the problem, if God is all loving and all powerful, how can such things happen? This answer says he is not all powerful. He is as much a victim of these disasters as we are. He can't help them and we can't help them. It is really an extraordinary answer. And then you ask then, what's the point of uh, trying to get through to God when there's a disaster? What help can he be to us? And the answer is, he can sympathize with us. He feels for us. And they quote a verse from the Old Testament, in all their afflictions, he was afflicted. And they offer this sympathy. Now, sympathy means sum with path suffer. To suffer with people. To say, I really feel for you. And so this is the comfort that even Christian preachers offer. God is suffering with you. He feels for you and then he will support you emotionally because he is present with you in the suffering. He will stand by you and suffer with you. I've heard many preachers talking like this in the last few days. Believe that God is with you in the suffering. Believe it's really saying he's with you in solidarity and that solidarity should be the comfort that you need. I believe that that is terribly wrong because the Bible does not paint God as a weak God who cannot do anything about the situation. The Bible is quite clear that God is God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and that he still controls and that he can still step into nature and make it do things that it wouldn't otherwise do. The picture of God and the universe in the Bible is I suppose a bit like a headmaster who has made a school timetable at the beginning of term and said on Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock it will be French lesson. But being the headmaster, he can any Tuesday step in and say it will not be French at 10 o'clock, it will be history. He is the headmaster, he is in control of the school. And though he gives these timetables for regular behavior, he can at any time change that timetable. He can step in and exercise his authority. That's the picture of God and nature in the Bible. That nature has been given laws and timetable, as it were, for how nature behaves. But the Bible tells us that God can at any moment step in and do something with nature that nature would not have done by itself. That he can do miracles, that he does do miracles, that can go against the laws of nature. Jesus walking on water is against the law of gravity, but he did it. And this picture of God as weak and unable to do much except sympathize with us and say, well, I'm with you, I'm alongside, I'm sorry, but that is totally against my understanding of the Bible. So perhaps we ought to be asking whether we're right in thinking of God as all loving. See, I've already tried to tell you that it's only these two assumptions that create the problem. Only those who are thinking that God is almighty, all-powerful, and all-loving, only those are the ones who have the problem. So that in a sense, anybody who asks the question, what was God doing in the tsunami, is already making those two assumptions. I've already tried to say that the assumption that God is not all-powerful is wrong. That's if you believe the Bible to be God's word. In fact, we are now faced with the other assumption and we're going to have to question that. Is God all loving? 
What do we mean by that? Is it the truth? To go back to something I said earlier, all religions of the world could be wrong, but only one of them can be right. And that is because there is such wide variation in what religions think God is really like that are contradictory to each other. You cannot put all the religions of the world into one. You just cannot. They have such different views of God. And so the question is, which view is the real view? Which is the one true God? The Bible claims to be telling us about the one true God. And in both the Hebrew language and the Greek language, the word true is the same as the word real. So the Bible is claiming to present us with the only real God who exists and no other. So that's why I say that all the religions of the world could be wrong about God, but only one of them can be right. And every one of us has a big decision to make there as to which God we're really going to believe in. Which God is the only real one? We're talking about the God who is in charge of our universe, in control of it, who made it, and can still do with it whatever he wills. All-powerful. But is he all-loving? You know, there was a Gallup poll in Britain not long ago, and people were asked, do you believe in God? And something like 67% said they believed in God. But that is an irrelevant statistic. It should have been followed up with the question, what kind of God do you believe in? What's he really like? Is he all loving? Well, next time we're going to look at this in more detail. But we're going to ask the question now, how can we find out what God is really like? What's his character like? What's his personality? What kind of God is he? How are we going to find out? Well, how would you find out what I'm really like? Or anybody else? You'd find out by listening to what I said and watching what I did. And I hope you'd find a consistency between those two things. I hope you'd feel that David Pawson said and did the same thing that his personality is consistent, that he has integrity. Well, God has that integrity. There is no contradiction whatever between what God says and what he does. And we believe in the living God, we Christians, which means that God is in this world and is saying and doing things. And the Bible is the record of what he has said and done in our world of time and space. And when we study his deeds and his words, which usually explain his deeds and tell us why he did what he did, we shall get to know him as he really is. And we shall get some surprises, some shocks even. We shall find he doesn't always behave in what we would call a loving manner. And we'll say more about that next time. So really my subject next Thursday evening, if you tune in, is what does the Bible say about all this? What does the Bible say about God? Is he bad, good, mixture? What's he really like? And then we shall ask, what does God say about ourselves? And we shall, I hope, come to the conclusion that God is a good deal better than we thought he was, and we are a good deal worse than we thought we were. We shall ask what God is telling us about the future. And one of the things we'll find that he's telling us is that earthquakes are going to increase in size and strength. And we shall ask what the Bible says about earthquakes in particular. See you next week.